It's time to take your seat in the front row with Mike Vaccaro. Here's your host, Mike Vaccaro. Hey, thank you, Chuck, and welcome, everybody. Mike Vaccaro with you in the front row. Behind the scenes, as always, it's JR Equipment, our creator, producer, and director. And we remind you, this is a CLNS Media Network podcast. Coming up today, it's episode number 52. Oliver Luck is our subject. Luck, growing up in Cleveland as a quarterback in football, went on to West Virginia, setting records with the Mountaineers, and eventually played for the Oilers in the NFL, playing alongside Archie Manning, Earl Campbell, and also Warren Moon. From there, he started a career as a sports executive, 10 years spent in NFL Europe, time spent in the Houston area, eventually became AD at his alma mater, spent time at the NCAA, also in the XFL, the second version, as the commissioner, and now trying to get a football conference going with the A-Sun and the WAC. So many things this guy has done. He shares his journey with us today, including stories about his kids and how he was a babysitter for the Manning boys back in his days with the Oilers playing alongside Archie Manning. All that straight ahead on this edition of In the Front Row with Mike Vaccaro featuring Oliver Luck. You know, Oliver, first of all, we, we thank you for taking some time out of your, your busy schedule to, to join us here today, to share your story with us here today. And, uh, you know, you've had such a great career as an executive, as an administrator. We're going to dive into all of that. But for you, some people maybe forget you're an athlete. You're a former athlete, <laughs> uh, former football player on the college level, professional level as well. Tell us, you know, you were born and grew up in Ohio. Sports, where did it fit in you, you know, your life growing up? How much did that play in, in what you became now? So I grew up uh, in Cleveland, Ohio, in the east, one of the eastern suburbs, University Heights. And, you know, it was a very, very much sort of an Ozzy and Harriet uh, existence. I was born in 1960. You know, we'd ride our bikes all over the place with my friends. We played, you know, all the sports, lots of pickup games. We uh, grew up literally right next to John Carroll University, a small Division three school that had you know plenty of uh, open space, if you will, and and had a lot of fun with sports. I gravitated toward sports probably because I was fairly adept at it. Um, played the you know sort of traditional seasonal sports: football in the fall, basketball in the in the winter, and and uh, you know baseball in the spring. And uh, I, I I suppose. Um, I, I was better at football and, you know, that sort of through high school and then, you know, on to college and then, you know, ultimately at the NFL. Of course, when you're a kid, you have no idea how far sports can take you, you know, literally as a player or as a profession. You don't really think about it. Parents weren't encouraging kids in the 1960s or early 70s to think about, you know, sports as a career. You know, you, you just didn't think much about that. Uh, but, um, you know, as you get older, I played professional football. I was going to law school at the same time at the University of Texas, got my law degree. And uh, I thought, you know, this this uh, sports thing could could be a kind of a fun business to be in. And as they say, right, with everything, you want to really enjoy the space that you're in. If you got to work 40, 50 hours a week, you know, Monday through Friday, you want to enjoy it. And I've always enjoyed sports and it's uh, worked out fairly well. Yeah. So many avenues these days within the realm of sports to work in and make a profession. Obviously you, you've done that very successfully. You talked about it in high school, 1975, the quarterback at uh, St. Ignatius. Uh, again, is that when you started to, to really excel on the football field and, and saw that as maybe your avenue out of, uh, you know, Cleveland and on to bigger and better things. I played football and basketball in high school and uh, Ignatius is an all boys Jesuit school. So um, very good academics uh, has produced uh, a ton of athletes, you know, over the years, won state championships in Ohio. And that's saying something because Ohio's got, uh, you know, some pretty good prep sports. Uh, I, I suppose that, that I saw, uh, a better future, at least as a college athlete via football. I had a handful of scholarship offers for basketball, ironically, but, you know, I had a bunch at the bigger schools, Big Ten schools, uh, Eastern schools, et cetera, f you know, SEC schools even back then uh, for football. And that just seemed like a, 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 a better pathway to trod down. Again, not having any idea, you know, whether I would even play in college or have a chance to play after college professionally. Uh, you know, back then, you think about it, there was hardly any game film. 
Uh, nobody was ranking people. There were no stars. Uh, you know, you showed up at uh, the first day of, of, of summer camp in college as a freshman, and you literally, you know, started to get to know your teammates, and you looked around, and there was, you know, six or seven quarterbacks on the roster. And you said to yourself, well, I gotta, I gotta somehow beat these guys out. I've gotta, you know, I've gotta become the starter or at least the backup my freshman year. You know, so you kind of plot how things are gonna run. It's, it was just a much different time. Uh, coaches, you know, didn't really, assistant coaches didn't watch that much film of high school kids because it didn't exist. So they would, you know, they would talk to the high school coaches. Hey, do you got any decent players you think that would, you know, translate well uh, into the into the college space? And I guess that was happening in all the sports. So it was a little bit more hit and miss probably than, than it is now. But even today with all the film and all the rankings and everything else, you still got plenty of guys you know, who get a scholarship offer at a big school and they find they're not quite good enough and they you know, transfer down to a smaller school and vice versa. Yeah. So it's still much more of, a, of an art, you know, than a, than a science. And I don't think it's ever going to be a, a, a real science. It's hard to take a 17 or 18 year old and, and project that individual, you know, in, uh, in, in, in college and, and how good that player could be. Yeah. So many Pro Football Hall of Famers that uh, worked uh, Power Five uh, players and different things like that, smaller school guys that went on to a great career. So, so you're right. It certainly is an inexact science. For, for you, West Virginia was the choice. Why was that the choice? Frank Signetti uh, Sr. was the head coach at the time. So what attracted you to the Mountaineers? Uh, you know, it, it wasn't the Big Ten. If you think about the Big Ten back then, it was Woody and Bo, right? You know, the Big Ten, the little, uh, the Big Two, the little eight. And they were just running the ball. You know, Ohio State or Michigan or any of these schools weren't known as throwing the ball. This was before uh, Joe Tiller at Purdue kind of opened it up. You know, it was just starting. The passing game was just starting to, to be, uh, you know, a serious thing in the Big Ten. So I, I thought, yeah, that, as a quarterback, I'd, I'd rather play somewhere where I can throw, you know, 15, 20 times a game. That was a, you know, that was a big day. Uh, back then for for a quarterback and West Virginia is fairly close to Cleveland. It's about a three, three and a half hour drive. It's a neighboring state. Most of the players back then, you know, were Ohio kids, Pennsylvania kids, New Jersey kids, a couple of kids from DC, obviously kids from West Virginia that, you know, that recruited. Uh, and it's a, it's a beautiful part of the, of the country. It's a, you know, small town, Morgantown, just south of Pittsburgh. Uh, and anyway, I, I, I enjoyed it. Um, it was a, a good opportunity for me. I was able to start uh, for three years. We had some success, particularly my, my last two years. Don Nealon, who had been the uh, head coach at Bowling Green for a number of years, he's a Canton guy through and through. Don uh, came down as our head coach after Frank Signetti literally got sick with uh, with cancer, and 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 uh, they made her made a change. And Don uh, really changed how we were running uh, our offense. We basically were running a veer. Uh, if you remember the old Bill Yeoman veer back in the in the 70s, and Don came in and, and reverted, uh, changed the offense back to a classic eye, which really suited our talent much better. Had a good fullback named Walter Easley, ended up playing for the, for the 49ers for a number of years. Had a pretty good running back, a tailback Robert Alexander, the great Alexander, who up to that point hadn't really um, sort of uh, met the expectations that, that that he had coming out of college and Charles I'm coming out of high school Charleston West Virginia uh, but with Walt blocking for him and Robert in the eye band, he, he ran for a thousand yards and, and that helped him get to have a have a, a nice professional career uh, a guy named Fulton Walker uh, we moved Fulton over to the uh, defensive side of the ball he'd been one of our veer backs and and uh, of course he he uh, ended up having a great career with the Miami Dolphins as a defensive back so Long story short, uh, we had we had some success and uh, and that was great and and you know uh, uh, kudos to Don Nealon for you know recognizing the talent that he had and and sort of bringing a, a different system to the to 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 the team which which ended up working out uh, very well. He ended up having a twenty plus year you know career as a head coach and is now in the College Football Hall of Fame. So uh, I, I owe certainly in college a lot of my success to Don and his assistant coaches. Yeah, you were there 1978 to 81. So, again, you were at the forefront, the beginning of Don Nealon's great, as you said, a Hall of Fame career there. And and you had an outstanding career, as you said. You started three years. You, you set some records. You're still fifth on the, the yardage, 5,765 yards. But you're also a Rhodes Scholar finalist and an academic All-American. What are you most proud of of your time 
in Morgantown? Well, you know, I, I guess it's a, it, it was a simpler era and a simpler time uh, in, in the sense that, you know, we, we being, you know, football players, scholarship football players, you go to school, uh, academics was important to me. I, I enjoyed learning, you know, I was a, a history major, uh, still read, uh, basically, mostly, you know, history, non nonfiction. But, you know, I think it was a simpler time in the sense that we all knew without you know, being told, you know, thousands of times that, uh, you know, a college degree was a, a great opportunity. You, you got it while you're playing football, doing something you really in, enjoy. So, you know, the my, my friends, my teammates uh, pretty much all graduated. And we had some great players, a guy named Daryl Talley, of course, played for the Buffalo Bills for, for a number of years, a fellow Clevelander. Um, the quarterback that followed me, Jeff Hosteller, had a great career with the Giants and the Raiders, won a Super Bowl, of course, with the Giants. We had some, you know, some very talented kids, but they all took uh, the academic component fairly seriously and realized that they would need that degree, you know, uh, once they finished their professional career, if they had one. So uh, nobody had to really force us. I think it was just uh, accepted, you know, at the time that uh, you'd go to school and, and, you know, get a degree in four years. There was no transfer portal. Uh, you know, there was no NIL. There was none of this stuff uh, that existed. And in many senses, I think it was just a, a simpler uh, a simpler time. And, um, you know, you said simpler time. How about some of the rivalries you had? You had Penn State. You had the, the backyard bra with Pittsburgh as well. Uh, do you remember those games and those meetings with those teams fondly? Well, I, I, I do. I'm not sure I could use the word fondly, but I do remember the, uh, you know, the, the rivalries that we had. And, and, and obviously, you know, Pitt was the big one. And they had, oh, my gosh, they had so many talented players, talented coaches. That was, I think, the peak of Western Pennsylvania, you know, prep football. And there's some great players that come out of Aliquippa and, 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 and uh, you know, other Pittsburgh area schools. Uh, Penn State was obviously a big rival. Virginia Tech, you know, was a big rival. That's down to the south. And the rivalry that people forget about, but we we played pretty much every year, uh, was was Maryland. You know, WVU recruited uh, a good bit in in the you know DC Virginia suburbs. Uh, so you know, Maryland was a rival. We played UVA uh, back then. You know, all all short bus trips, if you will. Uh, and then we had, of course, the other eastern schools: Boston College, Syracuse. Uh, we played Temple, if I remember uh, correctly, on a on a pretty annual uh, basis. So uh, th that that was a much different era. Now, of course, the Mountaineers are in the Big Twelve. Uh, we still we still uh, try to play some of those schools. Uh, you know, the last year we opened up against Pitt at, at the uh, Steelers Stadium in Pittsburgh. It was a great game, uh, but one one score game. This year we got Pitt and Penn State uh, as non conference opponents. Uh, over the years, we've added back. Uh, Virginia Tech and, and Maryland, but you can't play them all obviously in one year. We only have three non-conference games. You don't want to load up too much. But uh, those were, those were, uh, I guess the the glory days of independent Eastern football. If you remember back then in the seventies, eighties, uh, there was no Eastern Conference. Penn State wasn't a member of a conference. Uh, Boston College wasn't. Syracuse wasn't. Virginia Tech wasn't. Uh, Maryland was an ACC member uh, back then. Temple was an independent. So all those schools effectively acted like a conference, but there was no official, you know, official uh, structure around it, but everybody kind of played everybody else. And there was even a, uh, I forget the name of the trophy, but there was a trophy for Eastern supremacy, you know, uh, that, that they would award every year. Yeah. It, it, kind of a precursor to the big East. A lot of those schools became the big East, as you said, West Virginia then has moved on to the big 12. So uh, again, you had a great career there. With the Mountaineers, you, you parlayed that into your career in the NFL. You were drafted third in 1982, the third quarterback taken, 44th overall by the, the Houston Oilers. Uh, how'd you find out? Uh, I know there wasn't a big uh, you know, <laughs> NFL draft show back then and everything else. How'd you find out you were drafted, and what were your thoughts going to Houston? Uh, there was, in 1982, this was the 82 draft, uh, ESPN did exist. And if I remember correctly, ESPN carried the draft. It wasn't very sophisticated like it is today. I think it was probably Pete Rozelle, you know, up at a podium uh, getting cards, you know, put in by by his assistants, you know, when a draft choice was was made. Uh, but I do remember 
um, you know, having sort of a, a gathering at uh, the house I was living at. I was sharing with a, a couple other football players and, uh, you know, we had a party and a keg of beer and whatever else. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it, it, it wasn't, it wasn't like horse and buggy information, but uh, you know, it was it was it was a, a different. That was also a different era. Uh, but it, it, I I think um, it, it, I learned you know from from television, right? Like everybody else. Having said that, I did get a call maybe I don't know 35, 40 minutes uh, before um, you know my draft uh, position, which was I was the forty fourth pick, as you mentioned. But I did get a call from the Oilers quarterback coach, a guy named Jim Schaffner. And he said, hey, <clears throat> he said, Oliver, if we, uh, if you're still on the board, uh, we very well might pick you with our next pick, the Oilers next pick, which was the second, uh, the 44th pick in, in, in the second round. So there was a little bit of a, of a heads up. Of course, you never know, you know, if somebody else picks you. Well, in, in 82 was a shortened season because of the strike, right? But you were playing with Archie Manning. You were playing with Earl Campbell, some of the, the, the greats of the Oilers at, at that time as well. 83, you became the starter. What do you remember about that time and, and becoming the starter in the NFL? Well, what I remember is we weren't very good. <laughs> and I was the backup quarterback. Uh, we had cycled through Archie Manning, who you know still a very close friend. Uh, and and Archie was at the you know tail end of his career, and and he sort of you know uh, retired, if you will. And then Gifford Nielsen, who uh, was the uh, then incumbent quarterback, he of course BYU guy, he set a bunch of records out in Provo. Uh, Gifford started, I want to say, the first, gosh, I can't remember, first I don't know six seven games that year. Um, I think we lost them all, right? Um, and it was a, it was an odd year because it was coming off that strike year, and it was just. And the whole thing was a little bit caddy wampus. I think during the strike, we only played seven games, maybe or eight games. I, I really can't remember anymore. Uh, but I had a chance to start uh, because you know Gifford just wasn't uh, you know, making it happen, if you will. And uh, we won a couple of games towards the end of that uh, end of that year. Uh, it was great. You know, it's always good to play. It's good. It's good. It's good to win. Um, I don't remember much other than really that first uh, game that I did start against the Detroit Lions. Uh, we had a pretty good team back then, Billy Sims and 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 others, uh, and and we knocked them off at home in the dome. It was the first win of that season. So, needless to say, folks were excited about you know finally getting a, a, a victory. We had Mike Quick on recently, wide receiver with the Eagles at that time, playing in the the turf of the Vet. What was it like the the Astro turf of uh, uh, you know there in Houston with the Oilers? Well, it was awful. Uh, you know, I think I think the NFLPA, the Players Association, used to do surveys, and the two you know stadiums that received consistently the worst marks from players was the Vet and the Astrodome. Uh, you know, they had uh, zippers right where they where they put this turf down. It just wasn't you know it wasn't very advanced. Uh, no no criticism, but it, it was what it was. And and. Of course, you know, if you remember the story, you know, AstroTurf was basically developed because people realized uh, when the Astrodome was built that they couldn't allow enough sunlight in with these, you know, semi-translucent uh, roof pieces. They couldn't let enough get enough sunlight in to, to grow real grass. And they designed it, you know, um, so that they couldn't slide a, a field in and out like they do nowadays. So, uh, you know, the, the field short answer wasn't very good. I'm convinced that it uh, had a you know a negative effect on on players like Earl Campbell. You know, Earl was an unbelievable running back, very talented guy. But if you take away sort of four or five really strong seasons he had, it was a, a, a fairly short career, right? Because he he was hurt, and, and and Earl wasn't like Franco running out of bounds, or Earl <laughs> made sure you know he 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 tried to bull you know bull rush uh, any defender taking him out and uh, so as a result i think the the turf didn't uh, wasn't a friend uh, for guys like Earl and 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 others but that that was you know the the state of play so to speak in in the 1980s it just wasn't very good and and even today with all the improvements they've made on on artificial surfaces even today there's still lots of chatter uh, about uh, you know astroturf uh, uh, you know, should be removed and, and natural grass should be played. I think most players would agree that uh, natural grass was the ideal surface. Yeah, Mike Quick, I asked him what did it feel like. He said it hurt. <laughs> it was yeah. basically concrete underneath, and he only had a nine-year career because of that. As you said, the, the vet, like the Astrodome, just, you know, very similar during that time. And it's just uh, 
it, it takes its toll. Do you, do you feel the effects of that even now for you? For you? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm fairly healthy, knock on wood. Um, you know, like every player, you you got a bad ankle and you got, you know, bad this, bad that. Uh, but it, it hasn't been you know, debilitating in any form or fashion. I, I, I move around. I do, you know, I do a lot of biking, walking, skiing, you know. So, uh, that, yeah, it's I'm, I'm probably better off as a backup, quite honestly, because he just, you know, I didn't play all that much. And that, that keeps you from taking a, you know, a lot of the hard hits. Well, again, you were a starter, and then the Oilers bring in Warren Moon for the Canadian Football League. What was going through your mind at that time when you heard that they were they were bringing him in after you had been the starter? Like you said, you guys struggled, but were you feeling like this was your team and you wanted to stay as the starter? Uh, to be honest, no. Um, you know, the, the the Oilers, I think, at that point were very uh, transparent. You know, they had uh, told me more or less after the season, hey, we think you did a great job, you know, sort of coming in and starting and you got us a couple of victories. Um, but, you know, we, we think we, we, we don't think you're the guy to build around long term. Uh, we think you're a great backup. We want you to stick around. Um, and, and so, you know, they were very clear with me that uh, they were going to go look at the marketplace and figure out how they could, you know, how they could uh, get a quarterback that in their mind was, was a starting quarterback. Uh, you know, it was fascinating with Warren, you know, he played at the university of Washington, of course, but was not drafted by any NFL team. So no team had his rights. He went up to Canada, played for the Eskimos, Edmonton Eskimos for a while. Hugh Campbell uh, had been the coach up there. And of course the Oilers hired Hugh, just before they signed Warren, if I remember the chain of events. So it was pretty clear that, you know, Warren was coming down because he uh, didn't, you know, get drafted. No, no team had his rights. It was, he was a true free agent, which is very rare, you know, in the NFL, particularly a, a quarterback of yeah. Warren Moon's stature. It was, you know, Warren's a great, was a great player and a good guy. We're still friends. Uh, but uh, you know, that, that was no surprise, you know, and, and particularly when, when he first came down, and we started, you know, working out together, uh, summer camp, et cetera. I realized that this guy was extraordinarily talented. And I said to myself, golly, I can't believe the team didn't, you know, didn't pick him out of college, particularly back then when there was 12 rounds of the draft, maybe even more. I, I forget when they changed it from 17 to 12 to, to seven. Uh, but uh, it's shocking that a team wouldn't, you know, wouldn't spend, a, you know, a 11th round pick on a player like Warren Moon. But uh, that was that was the case. So obviously at some point you saw that your career in the NFL was, was going to be maybe short lived. When did you start going to law school at Texas and, and, and looking at your future beyond the NFL? So I, I, um, you know, I quickly realized that, uh, that you know, there was a long NFL off season and that, that was the case back then. You know, they, they, it just wasn't really a sort of a 12 month a year job. A lot of guys had had legitimate off season jobs. Some of them needed it because the salaries weren't, you know, um, extraordinary, if you will, or exorbitant. But anyway, um, I learned uh, fairly quickly or realized fairly quickly that I needed to, you know, somehow fill my off seasons with uh, with something valuable. I'm not a golfer and, and a lot of guys, you know, played the charity circuit or whatever. So I started uh, law school at South Texas College of Law uh, in my second year uh, playing with the Oilers. It's a, a very good law school, private school in Houston, it uh, caters to folks who are working full time, a lot of them in the energy industry and wanted to get a law degree, uh, you know, in the evening, et cetera. So I started the fall of my second year, uh, took a couple of classes and, you know, in the fall, uh, in the evening, which which I was able to do, you know, it's challenging, but but certainly doable. And then I would take a full uh, a full spring semester of, of, you know, five classes or whatever. Uh, and eventually, you know, that took me about three three and a half years and I finished up uh, with uh, the, at the University of Texas in Austin with a uh, you know, law degree from what it, what is a, a very good law school. Did you get the degree thinking you were going to be a lawyer or, or did you get it in the hopes of again staying in the realm of sports and doing things to, to be able to use that degree with? Yeah, I, you know, I, I, that's, it's a great question. I'm not sure I, I necessarily planned on a career in the sports business. Uh, you know, um, I had been involved with sports. I, I, I didn't sort of quite honestly realize I didn't take a step away and sort of look back and said, well, geez, I could I could, you know, parlay 
my experience in football, yada, 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 you know, into a, into a pretty attractive job. And that's ultimately what happened. Uh, but at that point, I, I just I wasn't thinking along those 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 terms. Uh, but but ultimately, you know, um, and it was an, it was an interesting situation because people in the sports business, people that I knew, people working you know for the NFL or elsewhere, you know, they didn't really have sport management degrees. That wasn't a thing back then. I think you know those 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 programs really didn't get going you know in earnest until maybe the the nineties or so. And we're talking you know, mid eighties here. Um, most folks didn't have, you know, law degrees that were working in the sports business. That was a little bit of an oddity, but I, I think ultimately it helped me uh, because, you know, it's uh, impressive on a resume if somebody's uh, gone, you know, gone to law school and graduated, you know, while they've been while they've been working. So, um, you know, in retrospect, I guess it wasn't that much of a surprise, but I, I certainly didn't plan that kind of a career there or, or the career that I ultimately had. Had. Yeah, a long career in, in on the executive side in, in sports. And for you, I guess it, it started overseas, the World League of American Football. You were involved with the Frankfurt Galaxy, then the, the, the Rain Fire. Also, you were in charge of NFL Europe. What attracted you to, to all that? And, and, you know, a time of uh, trying to expand the game of football and then some of the names that came out of that that eventually became some, some NFL players as well. That that may have been the, the most interesting you know, sort of ten years that that I've spent in in my lifetime. So basically, the the story is the uh, NFL in the early '90s realized and this was this was uh, Pete Rozelle's sort of last big initiative, if you will. Uh, they realized that you know the league was was by far the most popular sports league in this country, uh, but it was really uh, you know unknown. <laughs> the sport was unknown in American football. Uh, unknown to you know a lot of folks outside of the U.S., whether that's you know in Europe or over in Japan or or you know in, in Central South America, so uh, Roselle decided to launch something with obviously the agreement of of the owners to launch the what was called the World League of American Football. Uh, the, there were I think seven teams in North America, one team up in Canada, six in the U.S., and then three over in Europe: Barcelona, London, and Frankfurt. And I was was uh, hired uh, to run the Frankfurt team. And I, I guess the reason for that was really twofold. One, I was a former player, et cetera. But two, I, I, I speak German. My mother was born and raised over there. She immigrated in the 50s to the US. So I understand the culture. I, I had spent a good bit of time uh, as a, as a, uh, a youngster in, in Germany. And uh, so I go over to Frankfurt and uh, literally, you know, we had to start from scratch. Uh, to, to build the entire operation, if you will. Um, it, 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 there, there should be a 30 for 30 on it uh, because we, we, there's just a dozen funny stories about, you know, sort of what American football uh, means to the Germans and how they sort of dealt with it early on before they began to understand it. But I'll, I'll say this, the Frankfurt team was incredibly successful. Uh, the most successful club, uh, not just in in uh, that league, but you know, but but certainly you know amongst the three teams in, in in Europe, and the result of that is uh, you you saw this this past fall. They you know the NFL Europe League, which it became the NFL World League of American Football, became the NFL Europe League, and that that was um, operated, I think, through like 2007, 2008, somewhere along the way. I, I had left uh, in 2000 to come back to the U.S. after 10 years over there. But the result of it is now uh, an NFL game in Germany. You saw this past year that the Buccaneers play the Seahawks, I think, yeah. in Munich. Uh, you know, they sold out the stadium in, in about 30 minutes. I had a lot of my German friends who wanted to go to the game, couldn't buy tickets, called me up. Hey, do you have any connections, et cetera? Um, so uh, that league really sort of set the groundwork for uh, for success uh, in in uh, throughout Europe. You know, the, the, the league is doing, I think now three or four games. I, I, I lost track in London. Uh, they're doing games in, in in Germany. I imagine that it's a short step for them to do a game in in, in France or in, in you know Spain or Italy or whatever. Uh, the game's really caught on overseas. There's a handful of players. Uh, in the league that, you know, are Europeans, particularly offensive line. There's some obviously big guys over there who, who are athletic and, and don't necessarily want to play soccer. Uh, so um, that, that was a great experience. And, and it, it, I, I had a blast. Uh, three of my four kids were born over there. 
Uh, we saw a lot of Europe, my wife and I, and uh, it was fun for me because I've got cousins and aunts and uncles, you name it, um, over there. And uh, we were able to, you know, quite honestly, spend a lot of time uh, with them, uh, you know, as I was working in, in Frankfurt and then ultimately in, in Dusseldorf and then uh, I, over in London as well. So um, a, a great experience. It was, uh, I'm not sure you could really match it because it was a little bit of the Wild West where I was literally like parachuted into Frankfurt and said, build, build this team, you know, and uh, there was no, no. You know, pattern book. There was no uh, mentor that I had. It was all well. Geez, I guess we should do this, 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 and this, and it all came together pretty well. Was there, you know, a lot of education of the fans to to teach them what American football was like? Was there kind of a, a disconnect to start with that you had to deal with as well to create the popularity of it over there? Yeah, the 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 critical thing was, you know, in anything to have sort of unique selling points, right? Uh, you know, uh, obviously the most important sport in, in, in Europe and, and certainly in Germany is soccer. And the second most important sport is indoor soccer. And the third most important sport is, you know, seven man soccer, right? It's, it's the, the, the Fußball, as the Germans call it. Uh, and they're great at it, right? They've won, you know, multiple World Cups. It's a, it's a, it's a national passion. So, you know, we had to, and I, I was able to do this, understand soccer and the audience and the connection that exists between fans and their, and their club. And we had to sort of figure out a, a unique selling point, right? A, a unique position for American football. And, and basically it was, it was a, sort of a young person's fun sport, right? Soccer was serious. It, it was, you know, life and death in a sense. And, you know, we said, well, listen, uh, this American football game will teach you the rules. It's not that complicated. Uh, we used to joke that the, you know, Germans would pick it up pretty quickly because football involves taking other people's territory and the Germans were good at that. So we, we, you know, positioned it as, as fun. We had music, we had cheerleaders, all the, you know, all the sizzle that many Europeans associated with American football. You have to understand in, in Europe, the only game that people really saw, you know, through the, the 80s on television was the Super Bowl, right? That was a, a big event and people would watch it, you know, start at midnight or whatever because of the time change. And, you know, the whole hoopla of the pregame show and the halftime show and all the, you know, razzmatazz and fireworks, they thought that was part of every game. So we really emphasize the the entertainment aspect of it, the sizzle, and use that to sort of entertain folks. Uh, our stadium announcer didn't just say third down, three yards to go. He was a DJ, and between every play, he'd put a, a you know he put thirty seconds of music on, and people would get up and they'd dance and they'd throw confetti around and they'd watch a play, and then the same thing would happen. So we 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 did some things that uh, were probably somewhat unorthodox. Uh, but we positioned it as a, as a, as a fun game. And the cool thing was, and certainly in Germany, this wasn't necessarily the case elsewhere throughout Europe, but, you know, Frankfurt was the, the headquarters for the U S army after world war II, And, and, you know, Germany had, had you know, the different occupation zones. The Russians had East Germany, the British had sort of Northern Germany, the French and the Americans, you know, sort of shared Southern Germany, but there were still plenty of American troops there. And, you know, we've worked with the uh, uh, MWR, morale, welfare, and recreation offices of these various bases. And we'd have these troops come out and they, they would help us tailgate, right? They, you know, showed the Europeans how to tailgate. They'd bring their grills and they'd be cooking ribs and you name it, right? We'd have massive tailgate parties. You know, tailgating, we, we accept as sort of a, a, a right right, for football fans to tailgate, but the Europeans had no clue what tailgating was. They don't do it for soccer games. We did it. We had to set up the, a whole space. We had, a, we called it the power party, pregame power party, and uh, we had music and, and rides and you name it, right? Uh, in fact, you know, at the end of the day, not just me, but my entire staff over there, we spent 95% of our time not on football, but on everything else, you know, in terms of making the event uh, a success. But you know, within the first year, we were uh, putting games on uh, and literally selling 40, 50,000 tickets at, you know, 20 marks a pop or whatever. This was before the Euro was introduced, uh, but it, it, it was successful. It was a lot of fun. I, uh, I look back, uh, you know, with a lot of fond memories and, and a lot of, uh, you know, uh, good friend friendships that were created during that time period. 
Yeah, sports marketing goes a long way when when you're trying to create something, and obviously you did, and, and brought a little piece of home to those soldiers as well. I'm sure they they appreciated that there in that time as well. Ten years over there, what what led to you coming back? Uh, you know, back home in a sense to the Houston area. You had a couple of different uh, roles there. Well, my boss at the time was Don Garber, uh, who's now you know has been uh, for gosh twenty years or so. You know the MLS uh, commissioner, uh, and and so this was this would have been 1999. Don, um, you know, was the head of what they call NFL International, and NFL Europe was a part of that. Don um, announced he was leaving the NFL to go to MLS and, and be their you know be their commissioner, and uh, I um, you know told the, the the powers that be at the NFL that you know I'd like to apply for his job. I did apply for his job, didn't get it, right? And I remember you know, saying to my wife, you know, we've been here for 10 years. This is a lot of fun, but our kids are getting old. Um, at that point, um, our oldest, Andrew, uh, the future quarterback, he was probably, what, I think he was uh, 11, you know, years old or so. And, you know, I didn't want to stay in, in, in Europe forever. I, I love Europe. We, we go back uh, all the time. In fact, one of my kids is, is living over there full time. But uh, we... Uh, decided, my wife and I, that it made sense to get back to the U.S. and get the kids in, in, in you know, the U.S. school system and the sports system and, and all of that. So uh, that was uh, 2000 when I, when I came back to the U.S. Eventually, again, you were in Houston, had some different roles, but eventually you go back to your alma mater, West Virginia, as the athletic director and, and started in, in 2010. You, you worked in professional sports on the executive side. Now you go into the college realm. What was the difference in that? And was it a challenge for you to, to make that, that switch and that mindset? Because college athletics is, is certainly a different animal among itself as well. College sports was different. If, if the first, you know, my first sort of foray into college sports with responsibility, not just being a, you know, a, a student athlete, uh, you really begin to understand uh, it's, it's got its quirks. <laughs> like any industry, it's, it's unusual. But uh, I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, but you, and you also realize how how important an institution college athletics is. I mean, people care about college sports; they really do. I'm stating the obvious, uh, but there's incredible passion. There's incredible money. Uh, there's incredible support. Uh, and you know, uh, for a lot of folks, they look at the state's flagship university and maybe they see a you know a, a healthcare or educational mission. But a lot of folks see you know see sports as as uh, you know, one of those things that the universities you know, do fairly well. The other thing, too, that people forget, it's incredibly American. Nobody else does what we do with, with our university athletic programs. There's great schools over, you know, in Europe or South America, Asia, you know, great universities with long traditions. And nobody else does what we do. When I was in Europe and working for the NFL, I used to have people, you know, come up to me and ask me, Mr. Luck, why... To 110,000 people fill up the Michigan Stadium, you know, paying good money for a ticket to watch amateurs play. Why, why do they do that? I, they get why they would watch professionals, but they don't understand, you know, why amateurs are, are so popular. And it's hard to explain, right? To, you know, uh, my mother graduated from a university in Germany, uh, and, you know, they didn't have any sports teams. She doesn't get invited back for homecoming. She doesn't get hit up for donations, you know. Uh, it's, it's a different what we've done is is really unique and i think it's one of the reasons why certainly today you know people struggle with with how how what, what does college sports really mean should these players receive stipends now they're receiving you know nil opportunities should they be employees are they being exploited you know blah 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 uh, because we're the only ones that really have done this you know it's uh, what i like to call american exceptionalism in terms of having our universities have these these uh, you know, these these massively popular sports teams. Certainly, at least in football, uh, basketball, you know, a couple of the other more more popular intercollegiate sports. Yeah, football is the one that's kind of driving a lot of the changes in college athletics and the landscape these days. And and you were on the committee, the 2013 member of the college football playoff committee. What was that like? That experience to get that going and and to see what that's becoming and now expansion, uh, you know, coming up here soon with that. Uh, well, it was, it was a, a lot of fun. We, we, you know, it was the first group that, that got together. We effectively, 
uh, you know, I think um, took the, the same model that had been done with, you know, the basketball selection committee or the baseball selection committee, et cetera. We follow that model pretty, pretty closely. You know, we didn't think or I didn't think it was all that difficult to come up with the top four because that's really all that mattered, you know, ultimately because of, it was a 14 playoff, obviously. I think it's going to be much more difficult and much more time consuming to come up with the 12. Um, you know, we had a little bit of a tough decision at the very end of the season. Of course, the only ranking that really matters is the last one. Uh, but we had a, you know, a challenge because uh, if you remember Ohio State um, had lost a game early that season to Virginia Tech at home, if I remember correctly, which was a surprise. But then they came on like a house of fire and, you know, um, beat Michigan, beat uh, one of the Big Ten championship with a backup quarterback, Cardale Jones, or a third-string quarterback, I guess I don't remember all the details. And that was a real challenge in, in, as far as who was number four, you know, in, in that first year because both TCU and Baylor had had pretty good one-loss seasons. And, and, you know, so that that was a little bit of a controversial thing. But the first four I don't think is that difficult. And the, the top 12 is going to be tough. I mean, there, there are going to be some – some real, you know, challenges. But it was a great group of people. Uh, you know, we had Condoleezza Rice on that uh, committee and a number of, you know, of other, so Pat Hayden, another number of other high-profile uh, folks. And I think we we set some somewhat of a standard that it could be done without too much controversy. If you remember, Ohio State went on to win the semifinal game and win the championship. So they clearly were one of the top four teams, you know, in the – in, in the country, um, uh, but it, it, it was it was enjoyable. But again, it, it it's also something unusual, and you really had to kind of create that whole system out of whole cloth, you know, because there really probably isn't any other system outside the U.S. outside the college system in the U.S. where you would put a group together to decide who the top four is. Normally, there's a playoff system, right? Like like professional sports has, like all the you know, the European sports. So it is, again, one of these American exceptionalism things that uh, that I don't think we truly appreciate. Uh, and it's also, in a sense, kind of virgin territory because we haven't done it before. In this case, we had done it with, with basketball and baseball and the other college sports, but it's still, football's a different animal, as you know. Yeah, again, football is, is again, making a lot of these changes uh, that we're seeing in college athletics. For you, you made another change going from West Virginia directly to the NCAA. What attracted you to that position at that time? Obviously, your son was playing in Indianapolis uh, with the Colts as the quarterback. Did, did that play a role into to you moving to Indianapolis? You know, not not really. I mean, we uh, when when we were in Morgantown, uh, and, and, and you know, we drive up to Indy for a lot of the games, uh, and and you know that that was a fairly you know easy. Uh, easy trip. I was more captivated by trying to understand how the NCAA function, how the, 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 the this organization that, uh, you know, had a very important role uh, in college athletics, you know, the D1, D2, D3, all the different sports, 90 some championships, you know, all the academic components. I, I was just interested in the, in the processes that they use to, to make decisions, you know, because it's a little bit of a mystery, quite honestly. You know, there's something like 200 and some committees at the NCAA. How do they function? What's important to them? You know, why do we have, and this was when, when you know, amateurism was, was a thing, right? Uh, you know, how do we, uh, how do they come to some of these decisions that many people look at and say, that's kind of silly. That's really picky and in there. So I was really more interested in, in the regulatory framework of the NCAA. You know, uh, lawyers, uh, you know, I think are very sort of sensitive and attuned to regulatory structures, right? Uh, that's how sort of the, the, this country operates. And I wanted to get a sense of the, the regulatory structure and how, how uh, firm the thumb of regulation was on college athletics, because if you over-regulate, you can really stifle industries if you, but you have to have some regulation or else it's a little bit of a wild west. And I think the latter is the case that we're, we're seeing right now with, you know, with NIL and, and, and the portal and all the things that are happening in, in college sports. So, um, you know, but I think by and large, uh, my interest in going to the NCAA was better understanding how the, 
how the sausage gets made, if you will. Uh, and and I spent about four years there, and uh, I, I learned how the sausage gets made. Of course, there's been so much change uh, since then. That I guess I left in 2018 or something. Uh, you know, there's there's been so much change. I'm not sure that any of the any of my experiences are even relevant anymore in terms of how the NCAA functions. Yeah, that's it's been about five years now with the NIL, as you said, the transfer portal, a lot of changes in college athletics. And as you said, you you, you left 2018, you left to become the commissioner of the XFL, the, the second uh, version of that. There's going to be a third version coming up here soon that uh, Dwayne The Rock Johnson is, is putting together. But uh, I know it didn't leave a great taste in your mouth, but what was it that attracted you to the XFL and, you know, something that was going well until the pandemic hit? Well, uh, the, the the attraction there, I think, was pretty straightforward. It's it's rare uh, that you know there's an opportunity to start a, a, a professional league from scratch. I did it over in Europe, probably one of the few people you know that uh, that had a second chance at, at doing that. And um, you know, uh, you're right. The, the 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 second version of the XFL started off you know very well. We had the five weeks of play had solid TV numbers from, from Fox and, and ESPN, had, uh, aside from New York, had really good attendance uh, at, at the various venues. I thought the quality of play uh, was pretty good. We had some pretty good players, kids like P.J. Walker, who started the bunch for the Panthers. Taylor Heineke was a backup quarterback uh, in St. Louis. He couldn't even break, uh, break the starting line up there, but he's done you know very well down in, uh, in D.C. We had some solid players. But uh, COVID hit, and like virtually every activity, uh, you know that 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 put a you know put a <clears throat> a damper on everything, and we had to you know suspend and then and then postpone the league. Um, I I hope the third time is the charm. You know, for the XFL, I think spring football because it's football and because Americans love to watch football. I think spring football does have a a future. You do need a deep pockets to fund it. Uh, there's actually two alternative leagues, spring leagues that uh, will be competing this spring, the XFL, which I think kicks off right after the Super Bowl, and then the USFL, which launched last year, but doesn't start, I think, until maybe April. Fox owns that product. So uh, we'll, we'll see how it works, but uh, you know, Americans love watching football. There are enough quality players outside of the NFL, I think, to have a competitive league. I don't know if there's enough players for two <laughs> spring leagues, uh, but if you know the, the game has gotten really so good, and, and there's so many talented players that don't have a chance in the NFL, they might be a little bit too small, too slow, whatever. Uh, but I, I, I think that uh, there's a good chance that the this this spring you'll see one of those le leagues really get established and, and have a you know a viable business pathway. Uh, and and quite honestly, I think the NFL could use uh, a league. Uh, that is continuing to, to develop players. <clears throat> you know, you add uh, one more game like they did, uh, and I think I saw a statistic towards the end of the season that, you know, the, a record number of quarterbacks were starting quarterbacks in the NFL during the course of the year. You know, some teams were down to their second, some teams down to their third team guy. And, you know, quarterback is such a critical position. Just the idea of developing eight quarterbacks or a dozen quarterbacks in an alternative spring league like the XFL or the USFL should be very attractive to the NFL uh, because without good quarterback play, you know, a national football league game just isn't that interesting. We have to kind of be honest. It's such a unique position and you need uh, as many, you know, talented, capable uh, players as, as possible at that position. Yeah, and, and you've got minor league baseball. You've got the G League with the NBA. There's kind of the, those minor leagues that feed into – uh, the pro league. So maybe this is kind of a way to feed into uh, the NFL. Well, again, you're a guy that likes a challenge because you've got a new challenge coming up. You're, you're chairman of uh, Altius Par Sports Partners, but you also now are the new executive director slash commissioner for the ASUN and the WAC football conference that they're trying to put together. Why, why take on this role again and, and kind of starting from scratch as you've done several times in your career? Well, Altius is a, a, a two different questions. Altius is a, a, a consulting firm that uh, friend, a couple of friends of mine and I uh, started uh, back with COVID, and uh, we've done remarkably well. We're helping schools navigate NIL, basically. We've got something like 38, 39 clients. Uh, we've got about 24, 25 employees, and we're effectively guiding schools 
uh, with best practices in terms of how they should be looking at NIL. Should they allow their student athletes to use the intellectual property of the university while the student athletes are generating revenue? What kind of policies and procedures? How do they deal with with these collectives that have you know, popped up all over the place? So that business is going uh, fine, very, very healthy. Uh, I had some friends who are at institutions in the a sun and in the WAC, and as i think you probably know mike the the uh, a sun and WAC schools there was a total of seven of them had a an automatic qualifier in, in the fcs they those schools wanted to take their football programs and form a football only fcs conference they wanted to add a handful of other schools to get up to 10 and perhaps even beyond that and then they wanted uh, you know, to figure out a, a pathway uh, to take that conference and those football programs and make them FBS programs. So I'm, I'm very bullish on any institution that wants to invest in, in athletics and in particular football and you know, grow, grow the program you know, from 63 scholarships to 85. If you go FBS, you've got to make all sorts of improvements, and not just in terms of coaches or weight rooms or whatever, but also in terms of support staff, academic support staff, you know, health and safety support staff. So I'm a believer that life is, is dynamic and not static, that uh, the status quo uh, is always going to be challenged. And there's schools, and they have a long way to go. There's no question. Schools like uh, Utah Tech or Southern Utah or Tarleton State, Abilene Christian, that you know want to invest. Uh, their presidents, their board of trustees, looks at the situation, and they say, if we're going to spend money on football, let's try to play in the, at the highest level possible, which of course is is FBS. So there's some great programs in FCS. Obviously, you know, you think about the the Big Sky Conference, the Missouri Valley Football Conference, uh, the CAA. There's some great some great programs. Uh, the schools in this new league, um, I think, are are ambitious. They they want to invest, and in, and I'm I'm willing to support and help institutions that that ultimately want to invest in football because I think it's it's good for the game and. You know, Central Arkansas um, probably, which which is one of the schools, you know, probably says to itself, "Gosh, we could we could be like Arkansas State, you know, school that is just up the road, and uh, you know, maybe a decision that, that we didn't make 20, 30 years ago put us on the current path that we're on. But you know, at some point, uh, yeah, we have to put a you know sort of draw a line in the sand and say this is this is uh, where we want to go, and we're, and we're gonna we're gonna do everything we possibly can to to take us there. So it may take a while." Uh, who knows? There's so much change going on in college athletics now that, that I've said to the presidents of these schools, you know, let's be let's be smart. You know, let's make you know, good, rational uh, decisions. Every campus is a little bit different, has a different decision making structure. But, you know, um, there's no reason that uh, within X number of years, however long that may be, that these schools couldn't be in a position uh, to compete. Uh, and, and look at the number of schools that have moved from FCS to I mean, James Madison has moved. They've done remarkably well. Uh, Sam Houston is in, on that pathway now uh, into CUSA. They've done well. It, Huntsville, Texas, uh, many people would know, is just like a northern suburb of Houston, and it's you know booming in terms of their uh, their enrollment. So they there's just a lot of schools that decide you know they they want to try to move up the food chain. And that's the American way, and I, I respect the uh, uh, the ambition that those schools have and the aspirations they have. Well, certainly with your background, you, you, you seem to be the right man for the job. So wish you the best of luck there. And, and it'll be exciting to see where that goes uh, with those uh, conferences and with that. And I got to ask you, you know, you, you talked about your son, Andrew, but he's not the only athlete in the family. Obviously, you are. But you've got a daughter, Mary Ellen, who played volleyball at Stanford. You've got other daughters, Emily and Addison as well. Who's the best athlete in the family? Who, who, When you guys get together during the holidays, who's got the bragging rights in the family at the dinner table? Well, my I've got two boys and two girls. Addison's a boy. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's so fine. No worries. But he played uh, soccer at Yale, and and I would say he's probably the best athlete. Uh, he's living over in uh, in in Uri's married uh, married an English girl uh, that who was a, a classmate of his at, at Yale, a great young lady. So they're living over in Europe. He's probably the the fittest A and B, the most talented athlete. No surprise. I mean, soccer players typically are are uh, pretty you know. Uh, pretty good. Certainly, I'm, I'm at the bottom of that heap. I think my wife's a much better athlete than I am. 
And again, you play with Archie Manning, you've got the Manning boys, and you've got Andrew who kind of followed Peyton there. Do, do you guys uh, talk at all about that, about, you know, again, how crazy it is that you guys were teammates and then you see your, you know, your kids make it in the NFL the way all of them did? Well, it, 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 uh, it is ironic, right, and, and really a classic small world story. Andrew was inducted into the College Hall of Fame this past uh, December, and they had the big, you know, the big dinner in Las Vegas National Football Foundation, which runs the Hall of Fame. And Archie is the chairman of that group. So uh, we, I was out there, obviously, with, with my family, and Archie was there, et cetera. Um, I remember very clearly, uh, very clearly uh, when I was a, a backup quarterback for the Oilers, and Archie was, was uh, playing out sort of his career, the, the, the end of his career, he would fly over from New Orleans. He never really moved to Houston. He'd fly over on Southwest Airlines at probably $19 a trip. Uh, and he would often bring um, uh, Cooper, the oldest son, and Peyton. And, uh, you know, as a, as a rookie quarterback, I was kind of the gopher amongst the group. It was Archie Gifford and, and I. And, you know, I'd have to go take the boys out for ice cream or, you know, play putt-putt golf or whatever, right? And so Archie could, could have a couple hours of free time to do some rehab or whatever, you know, whatever it was. So... I, I ironically got to know uh, the Manning boys when they were literally like, you know, six and eight years old or, or whatever. Uh, Eli, I guess, was too young to, to make those trips. Uh, but we stayed, we stayed close uh, when Andrew was in school at Stanford. You know, he reached out to Peyton a number of times about, you know, leaving school or staying for the fourth year, all that sort of stuff. And, and we just have a, have a very friendly, supportive relationship with, with the Mannings. Great people. Great, great genes for both the Lux and, and the Mannings there. Uh, we're almost done here. How, how can people follow you, follow your progress, follow what you do, and, and again, what you're about to do with the Ace Sun and the WAC with that football conference? Well, uh, I'm, I'm not on social media, so that's one, uh, one way that uh, they can't follow. <laughs> so just uh, stay tuned. Uh, you know, uh, I, I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm excited about you know, the opportunity that these schools have. I just think it's great that institutions decide, hey, we want, you know, to improve where our football program or our athletic program is. It's no different than saying, you know, we want to have a better nursing program or we want to launch a, you know, school of osteopathy or, you know, we want to start a law school or whatever. So I, I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased that these institutions have these aspirations and are willing to, you know, put in the legwork. Uh, both the A Sun and the WAC commissioners, uh, Ted Gumbart and Brian Thornton, respectively, uh, are are working closely together with me, you know, to try to figure out this 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 pathway. And uh, you know, it's it's to me, it's a great American success story uh, because you know, you, again, this country is dynamic; it's not static. Things change, and these folks want to want to make an improvement. I'm happy to to help them as best I can. You know, uh, navigate the the choppy waters uh, to get to, to where they want to go. Well, again, uh, I think you're the right person for the job with all your experience and wish you the best of luck. And, and thank you for spending a little time with us here today and, and talk about your journey with us. My pleasure. Thanks very much. Take care. Well, our thanks to Oliver Luck spending a little time with us here today and sharing his journey with us, doing a lot of great things and continue on in college sports. We thank you for watching and listening today as well and remind you to subscribe and like these episodes. Another great episode comes your way very soon. For all of us here, we thank you for watching. We'll see you next time, another edition of In the Front Row with Mike Vaccaro. Have a great day, everybody.